Welcome to How They Won. I'm your host, Bob Burns, and every week I get successful real estate professionals across North America to share their secrets of success with you. I had the opportunity to interview a brilliant real estate professional from Southern California, Jorge De Leon of Coldwell Banker Residential Brokerage. Jorge currently manages Coldwell Banker's offices within the Ventura and Oxnard, California markets, as well as serving as NRT's regional diversity chairman for Southern California and Arizona. I first met Jorge through our work together with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, and I've come to really respect him as a real estate professional. During our conversation, Jorge and I discussed how to best serve the Latinx community, the importance of treating people as individuals, lending practices and dealing with the language barrier, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, what it takes to make it in the real estate business, and a continuing demographic trend to keep your eye on in 2020. Thanks for listening. And before we get started, I'd like to ask you for a favor. If you like what we're doing on How They Won, please take a moment to leave a review and share with your friends. I sincerely appreciate your support. Now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode is brought to you by Leaders Edge Coaching. Full disclosure, I am a trainer and a coach with Leaders Edge. But like you, I can choose to do business with anyone. But I choose to work with Leaders Edge. Leaders Edge has the right experience, knowledge, and tools to help you take your business to the next level. Whether that means closing more transactions, or improving your work-life balance, or building a team the right way, the coaches and staff at Leaders Edge can help you achieve your goals. For more information, email coaching at howtheywon.com. That's coaching at howtheywon.com. Seventeenth-century philosopher Balthazar Gracian said, "Self-reflection is the school of wisdom." Often, the answers we seek are staring right back at us if we simply look in the mirror. The only thing is, we need to have an accurate mirror. One of my long-term goals has been to help our industry better reflect those we serve. If the realtor population better reflects the home buyer and home seller population, and the real estate management better reflects the realtor population. I believe our industry and our profession will grow and thrive. According to the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, Hispanic Americans have accounted for 62.7% of net U.S. home ownership gains over the last 10 years. Looking forward, Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies predicts 4.6 million new Hispanic household formations from 2015 through 2025. Today's guest is someone who I believe will bring an important perspective to these demographic trends and, frankly, opportunities. In addition to that, he is someone I really respect and admire. He's the regional branch manager for Coldwell Bankers offices within the Ventura and Oxnard, California markets. In addition to that, he's NRT's regional diversity chairman for Southern California and Arizona. He's on the board of directors for the Ventura County Coastal Association of Realtors, in fact, the current president of the Ventura County Coastal Association. He's past chair of Ventura County's YPN chapter, a past president of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals chapter in his area, and is super involved in the industry overall. But even with all those amazing accomplishments, today's guest says his greatest achievement is raising his family of six. Jorge De Leon with Coldwell Banker Residential Brokerage in Southern California. Welcome to the show. I'm really, really glad you're here. Thank you, Bob. It's, uh, I'm happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So so let's dive in. Uh, I found something interesting when we were discussing uh, before the show. You told me that you recently bought an RV and we've been thinking about getting an RV too. Do you have any trip advice or recommendations? Well, um, I, I went new only because I hate the smell of an old motorhome. <laughs> and I did some research on that as to what causes that stuff. So anyhow, I've taken some steps to, uh, some steps to avoid that happening to my motorhome. Um, that would be my first tip is, is consider getting a new one, uh, if you can afford it. The difference between a new one and a used one is, you know, just like a regular vehicle, you, you save about 50%. But I think that the reliability, the warranties that come with a new one are, are really worth it. Um, 
my wife and I had this dream more, more my wife than I, because I saw a motorhome and I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to spend my weekends and my free time doing all these repairs. And, and it has been the case, but it, I'm okay with it. Uh, but it, traveling for us with, with four kids has, um, has been fun. And uh, I've had to learn how to take my time. Actually, my, my seven-year-old daughter, we have two boys and two girls. Uh, my daughter said, you know, dad, I really wish that we could actually spend time when we stop on our way to other places. So like uh, we went to uh, we went to Idaho to visit some friends and uh, you, uh, Boise, Idaho from our house is about 18 hours. So <laughs> uh, and I and I did it and, and I only stopped once for sleep. <laughs> and so my daughter is like, you know, dad, I, I really would like it if you just. Like slow down and let us enjoy the the, the trip uh, getting there. So that's that's another tip is like you know enjoy the you know getting there. So it's about the journey. Yes, just like our careers, it's about the journey, not the destination. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, let's let's flip over to the business side. As I alluded to earlier in the conversation, Latinxes will make up the majority of new household formations over the next decade. And as one of the few Latino managers of a medium to large size, large size brokerage company, uh, Jorge, what do you think we need to do as an industry to best serve this growing demographic? So I think that there's it's a multi pronged um, answer to your question. First of all, uh, the, the Latino community is not just one culture. So, you know, so you can't do a one size fits all. Uh, with the Latino community, you have, you know, uh, first time home buyers, people that are move up buyers. And then we also have some very affluent individuals, affluent families. Um, and for, well, you know, fortunately for our culture, just because you speak Spanish, there's a lot of different aspects to being Latino. So. Um, if I were to approach somebody from, uh, uh, let's say, from South, South America, uh, their education level is much superior to those that may have come from other countries in South America or Latin American countries. So uh, if, if, you buy, if you talk to somebody from Argentina, for example, they understand the home buying process at a much higher level than somebody that was coming from a rural area in Mexico, for example. So that's the first thing is that you you. You, we, as, as managers, we have to figure out how do we bring in real estate professionals that understand the different levels of Latino community. Even, even in, in, in their area, I'm actually in Montecito right now, Santa Barbara area. And the, the Latinos that compose the, the Montecito community are much different than those that compose the Latino community in the Oxnard of Ventura County and even in Thousand Oaks because we have People from uh, El Salvador, we have people from Costa Rica, we have people from Mexico, with you know, people from Mexico being pretty much the gross majority. So um, the other thing is, as far as the communication with them, you have to learn how to communicate with all of them. And, and that's something that really bothers me when somebody wants to do a Google Translate to communicate with Latinos. So you have to understand the cultural nuances when you communicate with them and how, how do you refer to a bedroom, for example. In, in one country versus a bedroom in a different Spanish you know, speaking country. Um, and then also understanding uh, what, what motivates somebody to become a homeowner. So somebody just wants to shelter. Maybe their, their goal is to move back to their, form, you know, to their original country. So their decision-making process is going to be different than one that says, I'm staying here and I'm not going anywhere. So I don't know if that answers well, I think you touched on a couple of of important points. The the first, the most important thing I heard is it's it's about the individual. It, it, right. We've got to get down in the weeds, and we can't paint with a broad brush and make all kinds of assumptions that just because a client is Latino, they'll come to us with a certain set of expectations or even uh, 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 the same language that you know it's Spanish, but there's different dialects of Spanish and different, um, let's say, assumptions or or meanings to words depending on the country that they're from. Um, would you say that's on target? Yes, it is. And, and, um, and a, a different layer to that is, you know, the financing options as well. You know, some people are dealing with cash and, and some people make the assumption that the only way that you can get into a home is by having a hundred percent of the purchase price cash and ready to go. Um, so, and then there's another portion that, 
thinks that you know they have to have phenomenal credit to be able to get into a home. Um, so those are the you know a couple of the nuances that um, that affect our, you know pretty much everybody as a whole. Um, as, I, as I dig dig deeper into this, is it's not isolated to just Latinos. It's actually it's anybody that is interested in buying and selling a home. I find that really, really fascinating about our business and just about business in general is when you dig underneath the layers, we're all pretty much the same. We People have the same motivations, the same issues, the same questions, the same desires. And it's really about individual relationships instead of making broad assumptions about any particular group. Right. Yes. So what do we're going to get back into the lending thing that you mentioned in a minute, because I think that's a really special area of importance that I want to focus on. But uh, what do real estate brokerage companies, not, not necessarily individual agents who can communicate on an individual level with their clients, but what do real estate brokerage companies need to do to better serve the Latino market? So one of the challenges is how do we reach the audience? How do we reach those clients? And I, I find that some of the most successful real estate uh, uh, practitioners or professionals have figured out a way to, to reach out to them. May that be radio or radio. May that be social media. I, 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 believe it or not, our, the Latino community is very well engaged in social media. So I think it's a very good avenue to do so. And then also print advertising. Um, those are the three main uh, ways that I find, which is are, are pretty much the, the same ways that in general, we're reaching, you know, folks, but it goes back to the messaging. You know, what are the message, you know, how, how do, how do I articulate my value proposition as a real estate professional where it makes sense to a client or a prospective buyer? And our culture is, doesn't, you know, wants to look at the, at the path of least resistance. So for example, if they come to me and if, and if I lay all these different you know, reasons why, or not reasons why, but um, uh, what uh, these objections as to getting into home ownership, that person is not going to go to me. It's going to go to the person that's going to say, yes, we're ready to help you. We're going to do everything possible to get you into a home and be more enthusiastic about it. And, and I'll tell you, I personally struggle with that because you've, you've met me. I'm pretty straightforward, pretty dry, cut and dry. It's like, it, yeah, it can be done or it, no, it can't be done versus, hey, you know, the, the enthusiastic real estate professional, the one that is very, you know, that can actually articulate their, ex, their, their, their excitement to help someone. And I'm not saying that I'm not excited about he, helping people. It's just that the way that it comes out from me is, oh, this guy is a little too serious versus somebody that wants to be fun and wants to make the whole process fun, respect, uh, uh, dignified. And um, making sure that uh, the the client is listened to and that their concerns are are, are covered. Yeah. So it turns out you're an individual too, just like me. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's it, and it, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll I'll tell people just because it doesn't look in my face that I'm having fun. I'm having a lot of fun internally. It's just that I forget to you know communicate it with my facial expression that I'm having fun in this whole process. Yeah. I think that's why you and I connect so well. I'm very much the same way of uh, <laughs> behind my RBF. Uh, yeah. I'm having a great time. Uh, but let's let's talk a little bit more about what you said, because I think there is an opportunity in there and, and a vulnerability in what mm -hmm. you just talked about in painting a positive, exciting picture. So uh, here, here's what I mean by that. The city of Oakland and now the California Attorney General Xavier Becerra have both filed lawsuits accusing oh. Wells Fargo of predatory lending practices uh, by steering minority borrowers toward higher risk, higher cost loans. I don't want to get into the specifics of, of that case, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on what we as real estate agents can do to help protect our clients from predatory lending practices. And before you answer, I want to give you an example of what I see a lot, at least in my market in Des Moines, is uh, first generation or immigrants uh, that speak primarily Spanish trying to navigate uh, a complex uh, legal document in in the lending process, they'll often bring like a child or or uh, a friend to try to translate with this very complex financial instrument into a language they can understand. And I think it can make someone vulnerable to being taken advantage of. 
Um, do you see that in your market and what can we do as on the real estate brokerage side to help our clients really understand what it is they're signing? Um, so first of all, I don't know. I, we never shared that. I don't know if I ever shared this, but that was my story. As uh, when my mom and dad were buying a house, I became their translator. So I, I, I clearly remember, you know, when I was eight years old, you know, sitting at that escrow desk and trying to translate this. By that time, I'm already, I was already used to that. Um, I'm grateful that my parents have, you know, become accultured and they've, you know, they developed enough, you know, linguistic skills to be able to know what they're signing and ask questions and so forth. So I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to quote a gentleman that, um, he passed away several years ago. He was very involved in marketing for towards Latinos for real estate professionals. And when we had this, uh, the situation where, um, people were buying lo- homes with unsustainable loans. The question was, why did you get that type of loan? And, and didn't you have money for a down payment? And the, and the consumers were saying, nobody told me that I had the option of putting a down payment. They just put me, so that part of steering that you're talking about, it was, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of that particular situation with Wells Fargo and so forth, um, but I can tell you that those loans were the ones that generated the best profits to the loan professionals at that time. And it was an easy loan. They refer to them as liar loans. So, but consumers, they, if you tell them, Hey, if you, if they want to know what the difference between a, a unsustainable loan and a sustainable loan, they just don't know how to ask what is going to. So they're not, they're not asking that question as a consumer, how can I preserve my ability to keep this home for the rest of my life? Because that's very typical for Latinos where, they, they, they're not buying a home with the intent of staying there for seven years, which would be the, the, the average for Americans or, or 14 years, which is the new average. It's, they want to be there forever. They see this as their, as a place that they're going to hand off to their family members in the future. So I, I believe that real estate professionals, what we need to do is give the clients the option. So that's, that goes again with the, well, not again, but uh, it goes with the, uh, the concept of giving people um, the option informed consent. So if you, if you, if you meet with somebody that wants to buy a home said, okay, you can buy the house with, you know, three and a half percent down with FHA. It's going to come with a, with, with a life uh, for the life of the loan with, with PMI, or if you put 5% down, you might be able to get a conventional uh, that is not going to have, that it will have PMI, but it's going to remove after two years. Or if you put 10% down, or if you put 15% down, these are your options. Also educating them into what um, what type of financing to get into so they can actually get further ahead much quicker, right? Unfortunately, when you start talking in those terms, somebody will think that I am making it difficult for them to get into homeownership. So there's that little balance where, okay, you want to buy a house, 3.5% down is going to be the quickest way for you to get in there, but we don't talk about PMI. We don't talk about impounds. We don't talk about all those things. So we we have to educate ourselves to educate our consumers and the value of making an informed decision as to what is going to be the best financial way to get into homeownership. I think it's so, so important when you look across uh, generational wealth in, in general in the United States, regardless of any demographic trend, the, the largest single source of generational wealth is homeownership. And putting uh, someone at a disadvantage because of the language they speak in the ability to pass on generational wealth, I think is something that's really, really important to everyone, not just real estate professionals, but everyone participating in our economy. Um, And that leads me to my next question. uh, The National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, if you're not familiar with them, folks listening, it's narep.org. N-A-H-R-E-P dot O-R-G has an outstanding project called the Hispanic Wealth Initiative that right. gets right to this issue. And Jorge, I know that you've been pretty involved with NARUP in your area. Tell us a little bit more about them and their mission and, and uh, what they can do for real estate professionals. Well, I, I was, I've been involved with NARUP in our local chapter for many years, although because of, you know, you can only do so much you know, by, you know, being involved with the Association of Realtors and so forth. But this, this, uh, this wealth initiative is, uh, was introduced by Gary Acosta uh, a few years ago. 
And his intent, and then Jerry Asensio has been traveling the country also, um, you know, introducing this concept to other people. But we, we found that in order for us to be able to preach about wealth, we have to be able to live it as well. And that was the first layer of the initiative is to teach Latino real estate professionals on how to save more and keep more, learn about investing and learning about this whole, you know, accumulation of wealth so we can do a better job of, you know, teaching our client base uh, about wealth. So that's the first layer. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, individuals in the community that in the business community that are have Latino background and so forth. And Gary Acosta has been very good about introducing those leaders to fellow real estate professionals who otherwise we would have, we had no idea that soul was so, you know, uh, you know, a, a um, such a prolific uh, businessman or where we have uh, the lady that, that owns, uh, I forget her first name, but her last name is Arevalo that owns that mortgage company, also a very powerful um, uh, business person. So I've always mentioned that as a community, we don't have a community figure that represents Latinos in the higher echelons of business, for example. They're, they're very obscure, but when you ask um, an American to quote somebody that is a business person that they look up to, we can quote you several uh, individuals. Latinos, and even with politics, you know, we're, we're finally developing that, that whole process about being able to identify with somebody in, in, in politics that is a, a leader in our country. We're barely getting there. So I think that Gary Acosta has done a phenomenal job with that. And, you know, the other part of the initiatives that NARAP has done is is to encourage more Latinos to get into local politics and to become leaders in the community. So that for me has been an inspiration, you know, knowing that I have people behind me that will encourage me that if I ever run for city council or if I want to become a county supervisor, that I have this group of individuals that would actually keep me accountable for one, but also support me in that whole process. Awesome. And I think NARUP is is just a fantastic, fantastic organization. They have chapters in most larger cities, at least. So if you're listening to this, chances are there's a NARUP chapter that that is there in your city that you could get involved with. Uh, you don't have to be Hispanic to get involved with NARUP. I right. was involved with NARUP for many years. They're a fantastic organization. I've learned so much from participating in what they do and uh, they're, they're fantastic, but I want to, I want to pivot a little bit, Jorge, if, if that's okay. Um, this is a question that I ask almost every real estate manager that I interview and that, and that is, uh, I know you in particular, you ran a pretty successful real estate sales practice. And at some point you decided I want to get into management. Usually management comes with a lot less flexibility and a smaller paycheck than sales. So right. what was it that attracted you to, to getting into real estate management and, and, and what would you recommend people thinking about doing that? Keep in mind. So, um, I am, um, I, I love the mechanics of a real estate transaction. Okay. Um, I'll give you a little bit more of my background. I, I started in this business back in 1992, fresh out of high school. I was, a, I was a recruited by a real estate couple that had their own small uh, franchise brokerage in Oxnard. Um, but they did not have the ability of, you know, of mentoring me so I can understand how to better help a, a person with a real estate transaction. So I became a very infatuated with escrow because as I going back to the time that I was an eight year old kid where my mom and dad bought a house, I thought this is where the magic happens in an escrow office. So I ha somehow I convinced the broker to, you know, for us to open up a, uh, an, an escrow office. I got training as an escrow officer. Um, it was, a, it was, a, I, I, I can, if, if there was a PhD for escrow, I think I would be able to get a PhD in escrow and be able to put my thesis together and, and present it and have a PhD in escrow. Uh, so I spent about 11 years as an escrow officer after that. So when my now wife and I decided that we wanted to start a family as an escrow officer, it, it was not a good environment for us to start a family because as an escrow officer, you're bound by the closing. So, if, you know, an eight hour day is not an eight hour day for an escrow company. An escrow officer might spend 12 to 14 hours in an escrow desk, only visible for eight hours in the balance behind the scenes. Right. So 
at that time, I decided, you know what, I, in order for me to start a family, I have to have more flexibility. So I became a sales agent at my brokerage and I went to the brokerage that was one of my better clients. And I said, hey, I want to be a real estate agent. In my first year, I closed 24 transactions. My second year, I closed another 24 transactions. And it was, in, 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 I employed everything that I learned in, as an escrow officer. And then the other thing that I did, I showed up for work. Okay, which in, as a broker manager, it's my biggest frustration that you open up your office at eight o'clock and it's empty for three or four hours because that's just the nature of the business. You have to be available for your clients and you know, clients are not usually available until after 12 noon until six o'clock in the afternoon. But the point being, I'm going a very, uh, I don't want to go into a tangent here, but um, I decided that I get, no, well, now that <laughs> the, the, uh, my wife and I had our first you know, child, Oliver, uh, he's 13 now. And um, this is if, if this was in 2006 and 2007. And if we all remember what started happening in 2006 and 2007, the real estate market, the, the, the whole, you know, the, the mortgage implosion started occurring and so forth. So I, the, the paycheck was not as reliable as working for a company. So I went, my, I was able, I was, I was blessed enough to be able to accumulate roughly about 26, 27 months of reserves. And I went through all of my reserves and I had no choice than to go out and find a job. And I found a job with a builder. And at that time, uh, the company was, had this inventory of homes and they partnered me up with this other gentleman who also had a background in real estate sales as an independent contractor. And we were able to uh, get rid of all of their inventory homes in a, in a, in a down, down market. I, I think that uh, we did the count. We sold about 305 inventory homes in that period of time. Together, we became, you know, we, we, we were able to, to take advantage of the, of the situation in a, in a positive way. So we were able to put people in homes, sustainable loans. Some of these people have actually called us to sell their homes and so forth. But um, I needed a paycheck because now I started a family. So, but real estate has, has, is, is, um, is very structured as a manager. So eventually, um, I started a small company with, with a partner. Um, that didn't work out. And then at that time, a lady by the name of Jamie Duran came knocking on my door, asking if I would consider talking to them about the possibility of being a manager. And I said, you know what? Sure, why not? Let's, let's give this a try. So I actually sat down with Jamie Duran, not knowing who she was, knowing what the company was, but not necessarily being attractive to the company because at that time I thought, Oh, this company is way, it's, it's not who I want to identify with at that time. But when somebody took the time to explain to me what Global Banker was about and, and what they did, then I said, okay, I'm interested in doing this. And they took a risk on me. I'll tell you that because I did not have proven management experience at that point. So they gave me this branch uh, that was um, that they had, they had to do some structural changes and so forth. And I was, I did not realize that I had something to offer uh, the, the branch and we were able to turn it around. And then after two and a half years, they gave me another branch to manage. And um, so now I have uh, three branches with Cobalt Banker and um, we were able to bring it down from a hundred and some agents down to about 64, but every single one of my quartiles is actually producing. So we actually have uh, in our area, one of the highest uh, per agent productivity. So um, we just have productive agents and those that are not producing, we try to manage them into producing. Um, so anyhow, there's, I think I went on a tangent. I was trying to promise you, not, I promised you not to go on a tangent, but I did. But anyway. But that's okay. It was a really interesting story. And I think a story that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, so, so I think it, I think it was super valuable, but uh, let's get back to that per person productivity thing. And what you mentioned about showing up for work, you have an advantage as, as a, as a regional manager to have a, a broader view of the industry and what it takes to make it in real estate, whatever, whatever that may mean. Um, 
have you been able to boil it down to like an attribute or a skill or or something that you can recognize in, in an agent uh, uh, to be able to say, yes, you're going to make it keep doing that? Or maybe we need to find other career opportunities for you. Like, what does it take to make it as a real estate agent from your point of view? I, well, I think there's a lot of pieces to it, but I think that I can I can narrow it down to a couple of things. There, 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 there is a value of having a manager like myself as an employee. Okay. So, uh, so I have to answer to someone. So there's an accountability. I have a business plan. There's, there's recruiting goals. There's productivity goals. So I have somebody hammering down on me what I need to be doing pretty much on a quarterly basis, if not on a monthly basis. So a big portion of my compensation has to do with productivity and, and, and meeting certain goals. The difference, and I'm not, and I'm not bashing an independent contract, I'm an independent brokerage, but in many brokerages, a broker manager has to work in order to keep their company afloat. And in this particular case, I focus on recruiting the right agent. And then I can focus on a, uh, helping my agents produce more because I, I am not allowed to produce as an employee manager for the broker for, for my company. So I can focus more directly on how to help our agents do that. So I have to show up to work at, you know, start to work at six o'clock in the morning. And I end up my, 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 my work at six o'clock in the afternoon. So I work 12 hour days. How does, what does that look like? You know, I'm starting to answer, you know, text messages, emails at six o'clock in the morning. I take my kids to school. I show up for events like this, you know, to be ready to, you know, get on the phone call by nine o'clock my time. That takes prep time. Um, but then I also can, now I know that I need to reach out to my agents that have challenges with their transaction. And then I have an opportunity to observe those that are not producing because I want my agents to produce. I, I feel the, res the personal responsibility that if somebody is not putting, you know, a transaction in escrow, they're starving and I can't, I can't live like that. So, so I've approached it with, with my agents. Hey, you're not in trouble here, but I'm worried about you. It's like, how are you surviving if you're not putting a transaction together? What do I need to do to help you put a transaction together? Is it you're not converting people at an open house? You know, tell me, show me how you are doing this when you are uh, at an open house. How are you having this conversation with someone? I mean, do you understand what your objective is when you're holding an open house? All those, I mean, I ask, I ask a lot of questions and I'm pretty, pretty straightforward when I ask those questions. So uh, a difference that you see is having uh, someone in your corner as an agent who cares about your success as much as you do. Yeah, I mean, in, in so many words, and, and I wish that I would have been able to broach it in that uh, package it in the way that you wrote it. But that's pretty much what it is. It's just I, I do care for my agents. Um, I think about them. I, I, I hold them accountable because I, they hire me as their manager broker for accountability purposes, not to throw them a party, make them feel good about themselves, all that stuff. I'm like, I'm pretty much a hired accountability coach for them. That, that makes sense. As a hired accountability coach, I can tell you that it works. I, I see it in all of the agents that I coach that, uh, it, having someone to answer to, even though you're an independent contractor, works. It works for me. It always has in my career. I've always had somebody holding me accountable, whether I was an independent contractor or an employee, and it has worked for the agents that I've held accountable. So a uh, couple more questions. We've been going a long time, but I think this is a super interesting conversation. Um, often, Jorge, real estate trends start in California and they make their way to the rest of the country. A lot mm -hmm. of the folks listening to this are not in California. They're somewhere east of you. What are some of the things that the listeners should be looking out for over the next 12 to 18 months that you see already taking place in your market? So uh, boomers, this is the last year. The youngest of the boomers are in, you know, they were, they were born uh, 50 years ago. Uh, so I believe that the, the boomer population is going to be one that we need to be paying attention to. So we have to figure out how, you know, how do they get their information? How do they prefer to be communicated with? How do they want to have uh, a transaction go? So who, whomever has the ability of connecting with a baby boomer is going to be the most successful for the next 10 to 20 years. 
because it was a study that um, or a report that was published and I was interviewed by the local newspaper as to what the impact is. And after doing some research, we believe that 33% of our transactions in the next 10 years are going to have a boomer on one side of it. Wow. So with that, with that, so, so who wouldn't want to have an understanding that 33% of their business is going to be coming from a boomer, baby boomer, and how do you attract the, the, the best share or the, the highest market share of, of, of that demographic? Um, and, and believe it or not, Latino boomers also make a huge part of that. So um, I, 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 one, of my, one of the people that I follow on Instagram posted a picture. She's a, she's a real estate professional. She posted a picture of her baby boomer parents signing documentation for the closing of escrow on an investment property that they bought. Okay. Well, those folks are very privileged to have a, a highly, you know, highly trained professional on their side. And, and if you, if you treat every single one of your clients as if you were taking care of your parents, I think that's going to make a huge impact. Um, so as far as going back to the trends, I think that that's going to be the biggest trends. Uh, in, in California, we have a pretty much a net, a, a, a net zero when it comes to baby boomers, you know, moving out of the state. We actually have as many baby boomers coming into the state because of our weather. Um, in Ventura County, we have some of the best weather in, in, in California. Besides the fact that I can literally walk to the beach without living on the beach. Uh, and people like that, you know. So and um, the other the other the other thing that I see uh, trending as far as. Uh, in, in as far as the market in California, we we don't have enough single story homes, and and it's a, and it's becoming a problem because again we have baby boomers that prefer to live in a single you know single story home. They don't necessarily like to live in a multi level building, or apartment building, or, or or condominiums because they still want to be able to have their grandkids come over and visit and play in the backyard. So that's those are the trends that we're seeing. So in California, we're not building enough homes because we have you know we don't have enough. Uh, land that we want to build on. Um, so um, I, I, I believe that we now have sustainable home ownership coming. So we're not necessarily going to see the big fallout in mortgage, uh, you know, mortgage defaults and so forth. Um, the only thing that I do see in California is that those, def- those, those homes that were the, with toxic loans from 10 years ago, they're kind of resurfacing again, but not at the same rate as we had. 10 years ago, or even seven years ago. There's so many opportunities baked into what you just said, Jorge, and, and, and folks listening now can understand why I wanted to interview you so badly. You're a really, really smart guy with your finger on the pulse of the market. And I just want to wrap things up by saying thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your advice to everybody listening to this podcast. Jorge De Leon with Coldwell Banker Residential Brokerage in Southern California. Thanks for being on How They Won. Thank you so much, Robert. Good to see you.